Hello Survivors and welcome to First Aid Spray, a Resident Evil podcast by fans for fans. This is episode 33, wherein we are journeying to a small town of non-canonical adventures with the star's Exeter branch in Book Club, Caliban Cove. My name is Siniac, you can just call me Si, and joining me on the panel this week, he's the conductor of the hype train, in general, but especially when we're talking about one Miss Chambers, it's Moist Owlet, aka James. Hello. The captain... (laughs) <laughs> the captain of the Stars Midlands branch and the captain of the secret Discord server live streams. It's Firebutton Steve Valance. Hello. And our special guest this week from Crimson Head Elder, the master of retweets and the keeper of chickens, it's Aaron, aka the Oracle Dragon. Hello, everyone. This episode of First Aid Spray, like all others, was recorded live in our Discord server. Enter our little world of survival horror now to hear the show early and unedited, as well as join our wonderful community and keep up to date with all the latest news. You can find a link to the server, as well as all our social media profiles, at our website, fasprayPod.com. You can also help support the show by checking out our merch or by supporting us on Patreon for as little as $1 a month with various tiers, each with their own perks. Head over to patreon.com forward slash fasprayPod for a full list and the chance to create bonus first aid spray content. It's been a month. Uh, there's a fair bit of news to get through and there's a fair bit of housekeeping on our end as well. So first of all, our Patreon shout out for our latest supporter. Thank you, and I hope I pronounced this right, to Rafael uh, Pacheco um, for supporting us on Patreon. And thank you for everyone for your ongoing support. It means uh, a lot to us in terms of keeping the show afloat and creating all kinds of excess goodies. The Metal Gear Solid podcast is out now for everyone. It's done pretty well indeed, which is very nice. We had a great time uh, recording it, so hopefully you had a great time listening to it. And uh, still on the docket to come is the Dawn of the Dead and now the Silent Hill 2 specials. So they'll be coming up very, very soon. If you're not supporting us on Patreon, clearly it's a great time to do it. If you get in there now, $5 a month, you'll hear those two episodes as soon as they come out rather than wait a month. But even $1 a month will drive that number up. We are five Patreons away from hitting another goal and putting up another bonus episode. And we're getting pretty close on social media uh, goals and YouTube goal and stuff like that. So there's yet more bonuses to come to put in sort of like a backlog of things to get to. Also, if you'd like to support the show in a rather unique way, we have another piece of merchandise. Uh, Find our merchandise store over at our website, fasraypod.com. There's a link there that will take you to the store. You can pick up a variety of different designs, including our latest wonderful little one that I had to pick up immediately. It's Krauser's Soft Serve, as inspired by our Resident Evil 4 podcast. Latest YouTube uploads, we have five facts about Hunk. And which was written by myself, voiceover by Adam, and the editing done by Mr. KDB. And we also put out five wacky Resident Evil weapons, which was written by myself and our friend N7 Lionheart from the Element Zero podcast. If you're a Mass Effect fan, you absolutely should go check that one out. Um, uh, Featured James on the voice and me doing the editing. On Twitch, we have been ongoing with lots of streams, actually. It's been quite busy over this month. Uh, Remake 3 seems to have come back around again for a few of us. Seems to be back on that hype uh, in preparation for Village, I guess. Steve has been playing through Remake 1 again with the Real Survival, a.k.a. Faf mode. And um, I've been playing through Resident Evil 2, the board game. We've completed the core game. Been been streaming pretty regularly, so make sure you're following us to keep up to date with everything we're doing there. And the final thing... (laughs) <laughs> is our appearance on the Crimson Head Elder podcast is now out. Uh, after much editing, it's finally out there and it's it's well worth the wait. It is Resident Evil Wars pitting uh, the four staff members of the time of Crimson Head uh, in, a, in, a, in a battle of words defending their chosen Resident Evil game on the episode with Steve and I playing Judge Judy and Executioner and decide, deciding who wins each argument. It was, it was a great time. Highly recommend that. That is in the description of the podcast, so make sure you go check that out. First aid spray. You're really becoming a problem for me. So, speaking of Crimson Head Adder, let's circle back round to our special guest this week, Aaron, a.k.a. the Oracle Dragon. If you're on the sort of Twitter end of the Resident Evil community, you are absolutely familiar with this person. She's very, very active. I feel like most of the stuff that I retweet is stuff that you've already retweeted. Um, But first of all, I always love to ask this question. Where was your uh, entry to the Resident Evil series, Oracle? What game started off with you and kind of where did it go from there? How did you fall in love with this series? Well, that's simple. The first game that came back out in the 1990s. I was just a wee little lassie with my brother. 
We were given the game, and next thing you know, we were addicted. And my brother-in-law freaked out when he saw that first zombie and <laughs> hailtailed out of there. Went back upstairs, <laughs> never came back to see what happened. <laughs> and you were just like, well, I guess this is mine now. <laughs> Yes, and ever since then I've been in love with the series, and then we got Resident Evil 2, then 3, then all the rest, except for Guide, and Guide is so difficult to find. Yeah, do you know what, and I, I recently, I'm very happy to say, special shout out to BB and Mac, who put a copy of that in my hands finally, so I have I have Gaiden, which feels very special indeed, I feel show and beaming with joy from here. Um, but yeah, as I say, you're very active in the community, obviously part of, of Crimson Head. I'd be curious to know how that sort of came to be. And obviously, you're also known for your fan fiction writing as well. How did all that kind of happen? Oh, let's see here. How did that all happen? Let's see. Sorry about the accent. I tend to do that when I get excited because I'm waking up from a long little nap. <laughs> um, let's see. I think after... Let's see... I think it was around the time that I was getting really into the series because Resident Evil 4 just came out and I was working at a food bank warehouse and I was like, you know what, I'm going to make sure I get my character out there because I just discovered fanfiction.net and I already had a Resident mm. Evil character and I thought, okay, I'll just go to this website since I found it while working there and decided to write the story about my boy Shane. And his time in Raccoon City, and ever since the series updated every time, I thought, okay, I'll use the information we got from those games at the time and change his story up. And up to the point where we got now, it's what the story I have now. And it's been fully updated because a few years ago, a friend asked me, hey, why don't you do a what if story with Shane? And I was like, okay, I'll do what we can do with the information we have. And la di da, Resident Evil Shane's story. <laughs> I think, to be honest, it's kind of amazing because how much there is to dig into with that because there's so many fan fiction writers out there and I see it all the time where people will start a project and it will peter off and it happens to all of us. But the like the sheer amount of time that you've put into this is, is evident. It seems to be an ongoing thing. So, so props to that because it's one of those things that's very easy to fall off of and then not continue. Whereas this, you've got like several books worth at this point, right? Yeah, all the way up, I guess... <laughs> I got about four or five books planned out, and each one takes place at a different time. But so far, three of them take place in the same year, and book four takes place, I think, 12 years later or something like that. <laughs> and um, book three is currently, so far, the darkest chapter. I got to the section where we find out what happens to this one town, and I'm like, Hey, GT, you want to read it? And he sent me a gift saying, No spoilers! No, no, no! La, 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 la. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's great. Excellent. Well, uh, let's move on to a rather stacked edition of the Biohazard News. Our, uh, our first piece of news is that Gary Crawford, who you may know as the voice of Robert Kendo and Chief Irons in Resident Evil 2, the original, passed away at age 79. Um, there was also the, uh, the actress for the... I don't know what you'd call them, the fledgling vampires of uh, Lady Dimitrescu. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeanette Mouse, uh, age 39, also passed away at age 39 from colon cancer. It's been pretty rough. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to lie. A, a double whammy of, of unfortunate news, really. It's, yeah, it's, it's hard to know exactly where to start or what to say about this one, of course. Like opposite ends of the spectrum as well you know um gary crawford whose appearance is over 20 years ago now and ingrained in so many childhoods you know i think i've said it before and i haven't said it on the podcast but i'm putting on record my my favorite re2 line is irons uh line about taxidermy always has been so uh yeah that 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 will always stay with me but in the case of Jeanette, you know, she had a career ahead of her. You know, Village is going to be massive. We know that, you know, we're going to talk about that a little bit more, the reaction to some of those characters. Uh, and it's and it's awful that she won't get to see, you know, the the, the, the finished product and, and the full extent that her work has on people. It's, it's really sad. I mean, it's appropriate we've got Oracle on because like Crimson Head and podcasts like mm. that, they talk to a lot of the voice actors and actresses. And I believe Jeanette would have been much like most recent actors and actresses in the in the games have like you know pretty much been entered the community in nothing but uh, appreciation and uh, kindness that uh, that she's going to miss out on and you know horrible 
it's horrible that what's happened to her in the first place. But the fact that she doesn't even get that treatment or appreciation is just uh, it's, it leaves a bad taste. Yeah, sadly so. Uh, obviously, as you mentioned, um, that Crimson Head, you guys had uh, Gary Crawford on at one point, and you got to speak to him. So that must be. I don't know how that would feel now. It must be weird, uh, but I, I suppose it's nice to have that memory. And I think in terms of... Because obviously with the, with the majority of Resident Evil voice actors, we're not talking big Hollywood names or anything even remotely that. I always... What I love about stuff like Crimson Head is bringing these voice actors on and letting them know just how beloved uh, those appearances have been. So my hope is that he at least kind of understood through things like Crimson Head and, and I'm, I imagine he probably turned up on Residents of Evil and all kinds of websites like that, that he understood his place in the Resident Evil sort of fandom and, and how beloved those appearances were. In uh, the interview with him that day uh, for us on Crimson Head, we interviewed him two days after my dad passed away. So he was my, he helped me through this, my wow. uh, morning session and stuff. And just talking to him and just saying what was going on and stuff. He, he understood and was comforting me. And then ever since we had that podcast, it's been my favorite podcast because every time I listen to him and helps me relax knowing that, yeah, my dad died two days before, but you helped me through my suffering and mourning. And I really did appreciate him. Yeah, that's that's heavy. That's beautiful, though, isn't it? Really, I mean, that's that's exact exactly that. You like I say, you got to have that moment at least. That's not to get too soppy, but that is that's what life is about, really, isn't it? It's yeah, those, it's, it's it's those treasured moments like that. Like, mm. you no, know, yeah, like I mean, and in the future with Jeanette, like she's gonna scare the crap out of us, right? And that's what's what she would have wanted from that character, and mm. you know, and you know, I think we're going to appreciate that character more as well, um, due to that. Um, and yeah, it's it's so sad. It's when whenever something like this happens, it's so sad. And I, yeah, just just want you know, just want their families and friends to know that we're all with them. We all support them. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that, yeah. That's where I'd, I'd at least just to put the full stop on this this one. Keep it short. But yeah, you know, thoughts with. The families and the friends, of course, as well as the community to, to both of those guys. Yeah. So our next piece of news, uh, I don't know if you've heard, but Capcom presented a Resident Evil showcase revealing Village's release date of May 7th, as well as some gameplay teasers and its different versions. <laughs> so first of all, let's get on the high horse again. Do you remember when Remake 2 came out and I was really upset that the... Uh, the what, deluxe edition is digital only. Well, they've gone down that route again, so I'm not happy with that. But overall, I think we were we were pretty positive with the the Resident Evil showcase. We don't need to go t- too far into the nitty gritty because we actually we we reacted to it as it happened. We streamed our reactions, and that's on our YouTube now. If you want to check that out, so you know our immediate reactions to that are out there. Um, so you say that you say that at the time I had just finished work and I was three quarters knackered. So I was like, uh, I mean, oh, by that's, all means, that was by pretty all decent means. actually. Oh yeah, and, and that was it. I if mean, you, I mean, feel free to add to it. Absolutely. I mean, my my opinion now, having seen it, is yeah, it was pretty decent actually. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> Yeah, it's, there was a, a lot to unpack there, as we tried to do, and, and some some stuff has come out to sort of muse upon, which has been my favourite thing about it, is, you know, all the sort of the subtlety and the hints and stuff. We're no closer to sort of revealing the, the actual truth, but we got our first extended look at a few more characters and locations and stuff like that. You know, the Maiden demo is out, which was very brief, uh, but very nice indeed. Uh, yeah, May 7th, very excited for that. Um, Aaron, what was your reaction to the showcase? I thought it was pretty good. They did it out nicely. They gave us visuals and interactions with the characters and a temporary gameplay and gave us a little bit of backstory and stuff. And it's like, okay, this is going to be interesting. We got a very huge map. So what's mm. going to happen? What's this story going to be about? They just tease us that Chris took Ethan's baby. We're going to a castle with possibly vampires and witches. And it's like, 
okay, that's only a part of the story. Where does the rest take place? Is Chris really evil? Has he gone rogue with the BSAA? Because remember that statue that they are giving away with the collector's edition, instead of the BSA logo, it's a wolf emblem underneath them. So that makes you question so many things, and there's so many theories as to what's going on with this place, and why is Chris acting like this? Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely the big mystery. And again, I've seen lots of people on Twitter sort of making kinds of speculation and stuff. And, you know, we're seeing the Umbrella logo as well in prominent places. And there's lots of theories to do with that. I, I love it. This is going to be the first time that we, as a podcast, get to cover a brand new installment, really. Up to this point, we've only been around because, you know, from the remix. So it's it's really exciting to have what is definitely a complete unknown coming our way. And yeah, Capcom in my opinion, they handle it wonderfully. They're not showing too much at all. At, at all. In comparison to the the, show, the last showcase, which was basically just a review, a review mm. of what we already had, this was blowing out of the water by a country mile. And I, I, um, you know, I only called it in the aftermath, but the fact that like um, Sean from the you know the REP podcast did uh, the main demo, which was revealed that night. You know, they did the mm. old uh, and there's a demo available. Today, which is great. Admittedly, only on one system again. Cheers, Capcom. That like ten people own. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the hype around that, uh, I think, is one of the best things of that showcase overall. It's, the level of nerdery was fantastic because I was watching that stream and the chat just exploded because there's a note in there with an actual date on it. It was like, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, the level of nerdery. It's like, oh, we, you know, yeah, brand new game, new canon stuff. This predates yeah. Umbrella. Sound of was it like the fires of Gondor? Um, <laughs> like the beacons. Yeah, it was exactly. pretty crazy to watch. And only- here's the thing that uh, people were um, some people were concerned about, like the people over at Project Umbrella. They're like, "Oh no, Batman's going to have to rewrite the timeline." <laughs> uh, I'm yeah. sure they won't mind. It'll <laughs> take another the six only- or seven years. The only thing that I'm concerned about is the cover that they're using. Mm. Um, like, I think we, you know what I'm talking about. Like, because either way, whatever way it goes, I, you know, the community is not going to be happy. I mean, there's one way it will go and I'll be, James will be happy. But um, if it goes the other way, I'm not going to be happy. <laughs> so it's like, I don't like that they've kind of spoiled that. That, mm. that, that uh, yeah, the, the Chris uh, uh, Wolf cover that they've made. But otherwise, like everything else was great. Yeah, I'd love to get to know the I think the like uh Oracle said that like getting to know the characters is my the most fun part of of that yeah, showcase. Yeah, jumping back in with them after this time, that's that's always fun. They also revealed another game, didn't they, Steve? So we have another headline on that one. Wait, what they did, huh? So um yes, at the time. I believe it's actually over, but online beta testing for RE Verse. Has begun. I now hand over my microphone and pulpit to Sai. <laughs> well, so, yeah, it's allegedly um, a rant. I guess uh, <laughs> there is a rant. We'll get there. But yeah, well, let's at least talk about what this is before I have to get on the high horse. Um, yeah, so our reverse. This is the the thing we didn't know about. We haven't talked about yet on the podcast at all. Um, this is the multiplayer portion that comes with Resident Evil Village. Uh, it's like a at least what we've seen at least is a six person death match kind of thing uh we don't know the level of how many different gameplay types there's going to be uh but it's the the idea the concept is playing as uh one of the re engine (laughs) heroes so you've got bizarrely re7 chris um leon claire ada jill and Hunk, I believe. No, Carlos, yeah, I think that's right. Um, but I'd expect he it will probably be your first wave DLC in that case. Um, and every time you die as a human character, depending on how many like virus vials you've picked up, depends on what bioweapon you turn into for a brief time. That includes stuff like Fat Molded, uh, Hunter Gamma, Nemesis, Super Tyrant, and uh, possibly Mr. X as well. Um, I've dipped into a little bit of video just to sort of get an idea of what we're looking at, but Aaron, you're the one out of us has actually got to play it, so what did you think of Reverse in action in the in the closed beta? <laughs> I have played the beta. Yeah, <laughs> more <it> over us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you one thing. That people pointed out, oh, it's it's Operation Raccoon City Heroes mode. Oh, it's Umbrella Corpse. Oh, 
Guys, did you forget we already had this gameplay before? It's called Resident Evil 6 Survivor's Mode! <gasps> <laughs> it's basically solo or team base where you're a human and if you get killed, you become a zombie or a dog yeah, or that's right, a BLW yeah. then. For that, you come back, you kill another person, and you're back to normal. But with this one, it's like, oh, you kill somebody, you become a B.O.W. But the thing is, with that, is um, you have to collect virus samples across the map if you want to get upgraded to a stronger B.O.W. There is a chance that if you get killed, you become a molded B.O.W. or nothing at all and revive as a human again. But the more vials you get, the stronger you are. And it's very fun because you can get very competitive with friends. It's like, I'm going to get the most vials before I get killed. And sometimes players actually get all the vials, as many as they can carry, possibly for the game match, and actually not get killed. And that's very talented because since when the, when the beta came out, there was a bunch of lag issues going on for a right. lot of people. But others didn't have it, and they were managing to get points. I only was able to actually play the game fully without too much lag on the last day in the last few hours because their maintenance uh, fixed mm -hmm. the issue. All in all, to me personally, I enjoyed playing it, but I honestly suggest to Capcom that they allow people to take control of how to set it up in like Resident Evil 6 lobbies, you know, like right. you can host it and invite friends, you can set up the time limit, what you, the objectives are, or even like, oh, you can only evolve into certain BOWs, like the selection choices, they can give many players because some players won't like this, but others will. And those that do like it will certainly be competitive against each other. They're like, oh, I'm going to get the most points. And mm -hmm. then there's the ranking system. Like, oh, first place, you got X amount of kills, you get these points. Or are we going to have like a shop open to unlock collectibles, outfits, other characters, BOWs? Stuff like that. And if they do do that, I have a feeling that people will get very competitive and angry towards each other if they lose their kill streak. And that's what happens with a lot mm. of PvP games where people right. get too competitive and it's annoying. Yeah. And one of the aspects about this that definitely plays into that is that there's like a focus on revenge. So if you get killed, uh, the, the, the player that killed you gets a little icon above their head. I, I don't know if you get sort of extra score. I think you probably do for taking out the one that, that killed you as part of your revenge when you become your BOW. Um, so there's definitely a focus on that. I, I don't know if you get extra points, but you definitely get your kill streak back. So you could be on a, a streak of four as a human, go down, um, and then regain that streak by killing the person that took it from you, which is cool. I like the idea. And uh, generally, I, I, I'd have to say I'm, I'm pretty interested by the way things are going with it in terms of the lobby and stuff that's definitely going to come um i played the resistance closed beta and it was very bare bones there was no picking lobbies and with friends or anything like that it was very little options it was just for them sort of stress testing and stuff so when the game actually comes 100 percent you're going to be able to make lobbies and stuff like that definitely um james have you watched james, any re verse can stuff I, can i make one little pointer sure. too the kill animations with the bow's is amazing yes they are yeah the nemesis head you, stomp is the one that yeah, i yeah you can get like a first person perspective from both sides and it's very interesting experience especially when you're just running into the hallway and next thing you know you're being impaled by the tyrant or jack's grabbing you welcome to the family and punches you right yeah. in the face just seeing these animations from those perspectives is just mwah, beautiful yeah. it's it, it's gr some of the stuff you can see as well just like characters being ganged up on by molded that shouldn't you, you wouldn't think like oh leon and a bunch of molded or like claire being chased around by jack baker it's bizarre i love the wackiness to it uh james what are your immediate thoughts on re verse have you watched any gameplay um no i've been trying to keep away from the gameplay uh and any news of it really because when we first saw it it didn't really look that polished right and like i didn't want to kind of get a you know have a bad opinion from it from an unfinished game um but from hearing what Oracle said it sounds like it's got a veteran system, and I love vet like a nemesis veteran system, and I love that. I love that kind of system. It's so much fun. All the way back to uh, we can't do a podcast without me talking about Alien, Alien vs <laughs> Predator Extinction. Okay, where it had a veteran system, although that was a single player game. Oh, you could play multiplayer as well, I guess local. But yeah, I love that. So that actually that actually gets me excited. Actually, I um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Excellent. I like it, but otherwise, I haven't seen anything because I'm just trying fair. to. Yeah. I'm just trying to wait. I'm just trying to wait it out until they put out like a proper 
trailer and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, what I will say is, um, in terms of our original reaction, if it was the graphic style or whatever that, that put anyone listening to this off, um, as soon as you boot up the game, you can go in the options and turn the comic book filter off and it just looks like a regular RE Engine game. Um, I don't know. Okay. But I would say from watching some of it, I'd almost recommend that you keep it on because at times it can get a little bit too dark. It's got the grungy horror aesthetic. Doesn't really work when you're trying to run around and, and aim very precisely at everyone who's moving. You know, everyone's moving really quick and stuff like that. So obviously, okay, yeah. you, you know, you have to figure out what's best for you when you pick it up. Uh, Steve, what's your reaction to this? Have you watched any gameplay? I have. Uh, it's actually allayed my uh, worries a little bit. I mean, mm. I, I, initially I was lying like, oh, oh great, it's a, it's a multiplayer game. Uh, uh, that's PvP. It's not really my kind of bad. But then, um, you know, I, I took I took a break. Much like James, I want to see how the game evolves and see what it looks like then and then maybe pass judgment. Yeah. Uh, but it actually looks kind of fun. Uh, but the thing that gets me is, and uh, this is going to sound strange maybe for some people in the fandom, but the fact that Neobards are, are helming it gives me a lot of hope because when it came to resistance there are so many deep cut references and in jokes to like the fandom and the games themselves their continuity their lore mm -hmm. i think they'll do right by it <clears throat> i think they might be able to do right by it the concept of resistance may not be something that's personally my bag but i'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt yes and you can see that already a little bit in the game as well with stuff like character skills um the one that immediately jumped out to me is um Chris's sort of passive skill is called Pride of the Original Eleven or something like that. I was like, oh, that was neat. Um, yeah, it's with with Neo Bards. I, I think they they're the right people to do it. The only issue, of course, is that they cut the the real problem with Resistance almost is that they cut off the support for it too soon because obviously Capcom shuffled them onto this uh, instead. My hope is that this uh, has a few longer legs because we're not even a year out from Resistance and obviously it, it, in terms of support it, it's over now because Reverse is going to replace it with any luck uh, this will get more than nine months of support I should hope because I'm yeah I, I'm tentatively optimistic about this after watching some gameplay I have to say I mean don't be wrong Capcom if you listen to this podcast if you really really want to like get on my good side a season two for Resistance is not a bad idea <laughs> um, uh, 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 outbreak <laughs> <laughs> I mean there is also that, but apparently, <laughs> um, I feel like yeah. I feel like Outbreak is like the Half Life Three of Resident Evil. It is, yeah. it, really, yeah. it really is. <laughs> yeah, it is. definitely is. Yeah, I mean, to that end, though, I think I, I'm gonna I'm gonna close this out on a bit of a rant. Uh, it's sort of inspired by that, um, and sort of inspired by sort of our reaction to it being a bit like, hmm, and then you know, coming like myself and Steve at least have come around to watch some gameplay and be like, oh, you know, may, maybe this is there's something here. What I will say is it's it's okay to not be interested in this game. It's okay to not like it as a concept. You know, if you don't like PvP or this kind of gameplay at all, um, better yet, play it and say, okay, yeah, it's definitely not for me because you're getting it for free, so you may as well try it. Um, and as with Remake 3 and Resistance, if you think that this multiplayer game that comes packaged with the main game is taking away anything extra like DLC, your clock tower and stuff like that, or any time that could have been spent developing the main game, that that is incorrect i'm afraid it's two different studios making these things so they're they're not interacting with each other so the existence of reverse doesn't take away anything it's it is purely more stuff for you to pick from my point is what i actually want to say is you are entitled to dislike this game you are not entitled to shit talk developers and be a whiny baby about it you're not entitled to tweet about it using slurs or harsh language, like offensive language, you, saying that Capcom are doomed because they signed off on something that you specifically didn't ask for. Most importantly, you're not entitled to say, this is not what we asked for. You know, anyone out there, you don't speak for everybody. Sure, it's not Outbreak or whatever people personally might desire. But by doing this, you don't give it a chance to stand on its own two feet before you try and cut it down, which is ridiculous. Uh, you are just sort of saying, no, that's not what I want get rid of it that's not how this works we've said since episode one of the show that resident evil is so many different things now for all kinds of different people and i guarantee there's an audience for this game you know same with resistance some people were like abject like no outright uh and some people tried it out myself included and i wound up enjoying it um and some people on our discord server especially because we got to play together so i'll say that much um I'm not overly a PvP guy, especially not sort of six versus, you know, everybody versus everybody. If there's a team deathmatch, that's going to appeal to me a lot more. 
Um, but yeah, my advice is seek out other fans and play with other fans. And, and that's how it should be done rather than randoms. You will have a better time with it. And if it's not for you still, then that's fine. <laughs> it doesn't have to be. But, you know, you don't have to bash on it, the existence of Resident Evil as a multiplayer game. Uh, because it, there is a market for it. It is out there. And, and if you don't want it, that's fine. You don't have to have it. It's not going to be for everyone. You still get Village. You bought, you bought it, you still get Village. Play Village. And if you don't like Village, that's fine. Just wait a year. Because in the last four years, we've had RE7, Remake 2, Remake 3, Resistance, Village, and re So That's six games in four years. So there's, there's something new coming all the time. So if this isn't your thing, don't be a about it. Just wait a year and see what else comes. So my the short version, the TLDR is don't freak out and don't be an awful person over a stupid video game. Don't be a dick. <laughs> I could have just said that really, couldn't I? You know, it's weird when you think about it because I don't remember like, the caustic response to stuff like Versus in RE5 or even RE6. I think RE6 is like action gameplay and mercenaries and it's Versus modes. We're all like, yeah, these are pretty good actually. Yeah, it's weird. Um, it's suddenly how it makes, the, there's a jump there and suddenly it's it's not okay. Yeah. And it's like people say, "Oh, I hate Resident Evil Six. And why do you praise the multiplayer and the the game modes and stuff? You guys like that? Then why do you hate the game mm. with reverse and stuff? It's free. And if you don't like it, okay, go play another game. You don't have to be upset over it because people have their own taste. Some people will like it, some people won't. If you don't like it, then don't play it. End of story. Basically, yeah, pretty much. I mean. If they turned around and literally said, okay, we, we, we've heard you and we're going to give you a fixed camera outbreak through file three, I'm not going to say I would not have a massive b or anything, but I would, I'd be very much on board, right? Well, that doesn't mean I'm going to write off anything that isn't right. in the meantime. Exactly. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I don't really know. I have still haven't played the outbreak games. I'll get there. I will take an outbreak three if they offer it to me, but I don't get that by being an all about things. A hundred percent. Besides, it's not raid mode and mercenaries patched together in its own fantastical. No, we're going off track. Going off topic again. Uh, yeah, <laughs> never mind. Never mind. Because um, that's what Steve really wants, kids. Um. <laughs> all right. Well, I tell you what. This is what I want. Let's talk about book club episode two. Let's move on. Let's discuss Caliban Cove. And now. Reading excerpts from S.D. Perry's Resident Evil Caliban Cove, Dervla Clue, who you can follow on Twitter at DK Voices. Time jerked to a crawl, the events unfolding in front of him in a slow motion dream. David saw thick, tapering tentacles on either side near the top of the rising shadow saw a rounded slash in the corpse-colored slickness, not tentacles, feelers, and realized that he was seeing the underbelly of a monstrous animal that couldn't possibly exist, a bottom feeder as big as a house. The black slash of its mouth hissed open, revealing clusters of peg-like grinding teeth, each the size of a man's fist. When it came down, John would be swallowed up by the mass of jaws, or crushed, or ploughed into the icy deep, a drowning meal for the creature. In the instant it took him to absorb the facts, he was already screaming. Dive! Dive! Time skipped forward, and the beast was falling forward, arching over its long, thick serpent's body dwarfing the raft, its shadow enveloping the frantic swimmer. David caught a glimpse of bulbous, rolling eyes the size of beach balls, and it crashed down, sending explosive plumes of water high into the air, blotting out the stars in sheets of foaming spray. Before David could draw breath, a tremendous wave knocked into him, driving him violently backward through the bubbling darkness. There was rushing movement, a sense of helpless speed as he struggled against the force that tore at his limbs, struggled to find air in the sweeping torrent. Okay, so Caliban Cove was first published in October 1998 by Pocket Books, uh, at least according to Google Books. Sometimes it's hard to get 
uh, even a release window for some of these older books. Um, but we know that the first one came out in September sometime, so it's reasonable to assume that this is correct, and it came out October 98. Either way, it was republished in 2012, along with the rest of the series by Titan Books, and it is part of Perry's, uh, well, what we like to call the Perryverse, and it is... Uh, Part of our original commission for three novels, two based on games and one original story. According to an interview that S.D. Perry did with Writing Pictures, the story for both of the original novels, Caliban Cove and Underworld, uh, were born of Perry's own mind. She basically pitched them to her editor who gave the go-ahead, and that's kind of how it came to be. Um, so very interested to talk about this because it is... It's very unique because it's not adapted from the game. There is seven books, I believe, and only two of them are original stories. So uh, they're going to be interesting indeed. But before we get to the actual content of the book, uh, let's do what we did last time and judge judge a book by its cover. Let's talk about the artwork for Caliban Cove. Uh, all, all, all the variations uh, therein, uh, starting with, I suppose, the, the, the Classico. Uh, artwork would be again I think it goes without saying we we probably we could very easily say this on every single book club we're going to do the original art is better than the re-release uh, they're just yes they're nice and uniform but they're kind of bland um, in the the original artwork you've got that continuation of what you had from the first book sort of a, a mishmash of original art and sort of key art from the original game uh, I think it works really well uh, Steve what say you about the, the original art as it's the one that literally is in my hands right now, I'm going to go with a solid, yeah? Uh, no, <laughs> Most likely. It's, yeah, it's definitely the strongest. I mean, it's still got the Stars emblem as well, in mm. and the montage in the back. And it's just, it, it evokes a lot of what you're basically going to be going to be dealing with in the book's narrative. The only thing I might take an issue with is the Cerberus, but that's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a shame because uh, that's the same picture that's in book one as well. They used the same Cerberus artwork for the art for book one. I mean, but it's not even me, in Caliban Cove. Yeah. <laughs> all, I mean, all, you know, out of the, the ones that are available, the only one that's kind of weak for me is the one that uses the HD render. Like the the, mm. the third one on our little list. I know you, you can't see it on the podcast, but there's like a list we've got. And the, the, the third one is a Shinkiro artwork of Rebecca I've never seen before. So yeah, so I, I went a little bit digging on this one. Uh, that is the Italian release of the book. Uses the, the Deadly Silence Rebecca artwork, which is really nice. Yeah, um, that, that gets points. And the, the Japanese, at least I'm assuming it's Japanese. That's the Japanese one, yeah. Original that, art. I mean, that's Rebecca in what appears to be like the Co-Veronica star fatigues, so unless that's Karen. Um, I I assume it's Karen and David, but it is nice that there is an original art piece for these for the Japanese releases. Yeah, it looks fantastic. I love them. Uh, except for the other one, that's just the RE five render, and it kind of looks rubbish. Poos. <laughs> yeah, not not massively. Yeah, genius. that one I hate so much. The other three are very nice. I I have the original cover, but I never seen the other two covers before the, the Italian and Japanese ones. Those ones are really neat. Yeah, I had to I had to proper look because it came up before about sort of like the Japanese cover and stuff like that. So I had to have a further look into it, and they definitely didn't get stiffed like the the 2012 re-release has done, which was, you know, anyone could have made all of them in an afternoon. To be honest, the, the re-release ones they're all the same background with pre-existing artwork just put on top. It's as simple as that. Um, I have literally seen fan artists do better. A hundred percent, James. What do you think of the the overall collection of Caliban Cove artworks? So I've only got one, which is I think the first one, which is Rebecca running mm -hmm. um, uh, with the you know, with the servers in the background. Uh, where are you guys seeing the others? Because they're in our live chat. Should be okay. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Um. So really liking the third one. Um. Yeah, and the second one, I think we had the same opinion, right? Last time with the yeah. first book, like it's just a little bit wank. Um. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit <laughs> yeah it's just like, oh man i mean you know there's there's reuse and assets and it's like come on guys it's a cover everybody's gonna see that you know yeah and like this fourth one i'm not too i'm not too sure how i feel about it to be honest um kind of looks like you know something i would have done in year seven in my, <laughs> you know my tech room I just, oh that's a cool font let me slap it on the front um <laughs> <laughs> but I love the yeah I do I love the first one with her running um, and kind of the warrior stance of the third book because I mean Rebecca Chambers is forefront of this book and mm -hmm. she they really really 
well, SD Perry really focuses on her and does a really good job of that. So yeah, it's uh, good on her for kind of putting her on the front. But yeah, as you guys just said, like putting the Cerberus on the front, I don't think even the Cerberus is mentioned. No, no, the like, Tyrant gets book. a mention, but it doesn't get an appearance. Uh, yeah. The dogs don't. I don't think they get mentioned at all. It's very odd. But there you go. The only thing about the original. To... Oh, sorry, go on, Steve. I said they're probably pulling double duty as a different bioweapon that features in the book. It's meant to be like evoking of oh, the image. Oh yeah, maybe that's true. Yeah. Uh, the only my honest original... opinion about that is, um, sorry about that. No, no, no. Go is ahead. the reason for the tyrant in the Cerberus is basically this is a story about T virus. Let's give them a reflection <laughs> yeah. back to yeah. what Rebecca went through. Yeah, because I mean, the Cerberus was like the thing that everybody focused on, right? Like it was the the, the terrifying thing. That you, it's the first thing you see and. Mm number one and it's the thing that most people other than that you know zombies isn't everything but zombie dogs not in everything so yeah it's yeah that's true that's a recognizable thing but still yeah rebecca on the, the the first the original release though it, to me she looks a little bit too old i feel like they based her face on a model or an actor around in the 90s and i can't place who it is it's, it's really weird it's it really bugs me because oh, it's I sort of like mean. it's clearly Rebecca, but also it's not. It's <laughs> it, it sort of looks a bit like they had to have obviously didn't, but avoid some sort of like uh, legal thing where it's it's kind of like her, but it's not a hundred percent. But it work. It definitely works. It should say like you almost... take Shinkero, you take Shinkero, Rebecca in Warrior Stance and put her on the original cover, and we have the perfect one. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Let me open up Photoshop right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay so let's let's move on to the content of the book the story as we sort of alluded to there the original story in this novel um takes place well first of all i think it's interesting because obviously early on this is 99 or, or no sorry 98 this came out so um this is one of the rare examples of something coming out and i think immediately almost being questionably canon <laughs> because there was no canon back at that point really was that we got two games and a couple of books and stuff um but this one comes out and it immediately is a little bit contradictory with some stuff um that we either knew or we were about to have uh 100 confirmed it talks about the continuation of i think it's essie berry sort of trying to continue what she'd already written in the first book that also was kind of questionably canon so like stars being a big operation across the country slash world um rather than just being part of the rpd um, and that's a big part of the story the stars going into hiding the the, the stars alpha team going into hiding uh, not sure what to do next about umbrella then all their sort of interactions with the police sort of being ignored because obviously they're on umbrella's payroll uh, and then the arrival of david trapp from Stars Exeter, who turns up to tell them that Umbrella has infiltrated the larger Stars company and that he needs Rebecca on a special mission in the small coastal town of Caliban Cove, Maine. Uh, my favourite my favorite experience with this book was the first thing where, with many books, you'll open it and there'll be like sort of like an opening tease uh, on the first page. <laughs> <laughs> and it basically sums up as now the zombies have guns and i just thought oh perry if only you knew <laughs> this book <laughs> is so far ahead in terms of where the resident series was eventually going to go but let's get some student reactions overall to the story set up and where it goes from there uh aaron since you're the guest what do you yeah, specifically in fact you asked to be on the caliban cove episode i approached you about being on book club but i think you were the one that said how about caliban cove so i I well, actually, before we get into the story, my bad. Let's roll back. Uh, Raron, was what's your sort of first experience with the book? Was this how, how long ago did you first read this? How long ago? He asks. Oracle is not that old, but she knows <laughs> at the same time when she reads the books when she's a child. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. seriously we had these books when we were little kids and taking them to school and then worrying about other kids stealing the books to read because they like the cover yeah I bet yeah okay fair enough so you've definitely it's been it's been in your life a long time in that case because this is the first yes. time i've read it and i know james this will be the first time you've read it as well yep uh, uh steve uh, what was your first interaction with caliban cove um, I think I said in the last podcast how I got these on like a college binge yeah. right uh, Just uh, this is that. literally but I finished Umbrella Conspiracy. Oh, that was pretty good, actually. You know, I didn't, I didn't hate it. And then, well, I guess I'll start the second one. It literally was that, you know, Fair one enough. night to the other. The Netflix enough. effect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fucking binge. Right. 
So let, let's my my bad, the little tangent. Let's circle back round to the to the larger story. Aaron, what is uh, your feelings on the general story setup for Caliban Cove, sort of the opening, and and you know, I guess let's talk about the first half of the book first, because I'd say it, it's very easy to cut into two parts. This book, uh, how do you feel about sort of the the setup to the story? I find it pretty decent because they set you at a pace where everybody's concerned about what's going on, and then all of a sudden you get to find out oh there's more stars that's different i thought it was only for raccoon city like you said before and then we learn more about oh there's something else going on we need rebecca to go out and help us because ever since two and three i've always wondered where the heck did rebecca end up going to where is right. she is she in raccoon city did she leave and then when this book came out it's like holy crap this is what she's been doing this entire time mm-hmm. yeah it's uh it's cool to see these characters in the immediate aftermath because we don't get a whole lot of that, obviously, with the exception of RE3 that will come a little bit later. Um, but in terms of the immediate, immediate following on before the sort of zombie takeover of Raccoon City, it's it's cool to see those characters uh, interact. Um, Steve, what do you, how do you feel about the, the early start of the book? I actually really like it, the whole fact that they're like trying to cobble together and figure out what the heck's going on, even in Barry's house. And then yeah. evil stars members start shooting the place up and they're having to ram- you know, deal with that and try and reconcile the thought that these people they thought they knew who were co-workers are actually out to kill them as much as Umbrella are. Uh, I thought it was really good. That and when David Trapp is introduced, for some reason I just picture a tired a Pierce Brosnan type and uh, <laughs> yeah. gives, me, gives me a strong James Bond energy. Do you know what? I, I wouldn't even be surprised if that was sort of the uh, the inspiration, somewhat. You know, at the time as well. He when did he start as Bond? It was sort of like mid to late nineties, surely. Um, it, would, it would have been around this time, yeah. Yeah. So and he is a British character, so I actually wouldn't be surprised, considering the story handles sort of corporate espionage and, and, and stuff like that, and then molds and things a little bit. So yeah, I could see that definitely. Uh, James, what was your reaction to the sort of first few chapters of the book? Um, I like them. I like the setup. Um, it was nice to see the crew back together again. Um, I didn't trust David one bit, and like we're gonna <laughs> get into that more. And also, I think that's kind of a weak link of the story. Um, like a, a like as soon as he came on, I was like, oh, this is gonna be the the bad guy. And then everybody trusts him at the beginning. I'm like, wait, guys, what? Wait, wait a second, you. <laughs> Like Bar- like Bar- I know Barry might he-, he was a comrade of Barry, but that doesn't matter. Like you've been friends with people before and they've turned on you. Why do you suddenly trust this guy? Is it because he has an English accent? Oh, Is so that a British a- accent? Is that why? You're expecting a season two version of Wesker. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like I was yeah, and it um it kind of threw me off because I was expecting him to turn bad at some point because nobody like nobody kind of called him on it. And then I- that kind of confused me. I was like, guys, you've like, he just come in here and said that all this stuff is going on, this conspiracy is happening, and none of you are questioning him on it. Mm. Um, but did like the whole reunion. I love that kind of house scene as well, where uh, they have to kind of run for their lives um, and stuff. And like, I, I kind of love the, the calm of yeah. like the first couple chapters as well, where it's, you know, it's just, it's just Rebecca just chilling out on a bike (laughs) just rolling around you know (laughs) you know you get to know kind of what she's been up to and and stuff and uh it's kind of cool to see what she's like like just in casuals as well like she's she wears basically the same stuff i do she wears high tops and just like denim Mm. jeans and just like like a cut up top and stuff and i mean you know i'm going to be gushing about rebecca chambers this entire episode so i'm going to like just just not be going too far into that but yeah, I love the first few chapters of this, other than them immediately trusting David. <laughs> <laughs> it's got something that none of the other games have had, and that's Rebecca interacting with other Alpha Team Stars members besides Chris mm. Redfield. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 You know, they get to um, you get to have some sort of sisterly behaviour between Jill and Becky at one point before you know when when the sort of mission goes on, Rebecca sort of gets enlisted for it, so that's nice. Um, and yeah, just the tone early on. Like, there's, there's. We'll talk about writing style in general, but um, because it's a bit of a calm before the storm at the beginning, you get a little bit more humour. My favourite bit, my favourite line, the bit that made me chuckle the most, uh, is Barry being described as lifting weights with a vengeance or something. I was like, that, <laughs> that is fantastically nineties as well. <laughs> 
I, I highly enjoyed that. My and, and also speaking of Barry, you know, you kind of hinted on it there, and and you know he's got friends who may or may not be traitors. Poor Barry, man. He and we're going to get into spoilers yeah. with this book and this podcast, obviously. But then he gets shot <laughs> early on uh, and realizes that he his friend is a traitor and he's on the side of uh, Umbrella, sort of. All the stuff they're doing in stars, but, he gets re- he gets shafted here harder than he does in the game. Perry just seems to love to torture him. I think <laughs> he, but Barry's in charge, which is cool to see. Mm, I mean, he, mm. d- he does get shot. He does get shot, and that really sucks for him because it's awesome seeing Barry in action. But Barry's in like like unofficially is like in charge of the like the like the raccoon PD now. Like everybody kind of looks to him, right. which is so cool and makes sense because he's clearly the like the dad figure. Mm-hmm. He's that the old well. statesman. Yeah. Plus, you know, I uh, guess the guilt from the uh, mansion experience as well, sort of driving him to do the right thing. True. Also, um, like they don't kind of, I think they kind of touch a little bit on it, but uh, I always found it weird in the games how Chris is a little bit like nonchalant about everything. Um, I do love Chris, like in the original, but that was kind of my only complaint of him. In this, uh, you actually hear him talk about like him, him and his relationship with Rebecca. Mm. And the, the reason why he like kind of wants to protect her is because she reminds him of his sister, who he, he nice is. Touch. Yeah, yeah. And I, I thought that was really cool because we all see Claire as this badass lady, by and he's comparing Rebecca to her, which was really nice. And we'll go further into that later on um, as well. Uh, so, so that's the setup, and then we move. Uh, I guess in the direction of Caliban Cove. Now, this is sort of where I guess my my biggest bugbear with the whole book is is that uh, before we talk about the rest of the story, so it's just I, I did this even start until halfway through the book? I didn't feel like anything really got going until halfway. I thought the first half was. I'm trying to think back on what even happened. Like, not much seemed to happen, and it took a good amount of time before we even really got things rolling. When this new this small team put together arrives at uh, Caliban Cove and sort of stumbles upon the mystery. We, I guess we have some stuff with some flashbacks. you got the, the Smoking Man X-Files character, Trent, turns back up again with his, his list of clues, which uh, is an important plot point. It just felt like it got... It took a, a long time for me before the you know the wheels started to turn. I don't know if anyone else uh, felt the same way or if, if I'm alone on that one, but the, I, I just thought it was a slog to begin with uh, after those opening chapters. No, so you you're, agree. You're right. I'd say, yeah. I'd, I'd say it's like it feels like almost a three act kind of thing. You've got your pre Caliban Cove, you're getting into Caliban Cove, and then the final chapters. Um, yeah, mm. I, I would agree. The pacing's a little bit, a little bit stodgy, and it it suddenly changes as well. Like there is there is a sudden change rather than a gradual one. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is I think like that pacing of going from point A to point B is very sudden. And like I think that's kind of what the issue is because I mean we we've all you know we've all watched movies and films that have been slow to start and then got going and then like they've been good but it's because their pacing is good yeah in this book it was very like oh and now they're here <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah yeah the story starts to turn with the arrival of this mysterious underwater bow that's when you're like right okay now we <laughs> now we've arrived <laughs> uh, so the main driving plot. The mission of this is uh, this mysterious uh, potential outbreak that's happened at Caliban Cove, um, and the man behind it, Nicholas Griffith, uh, who is there is no like subtle way to put this. I guess he's just a mad scientist essentially, um, and this is where we start to get to some what I think is some really interesting stuff in terms of conceptually. Um, S. C. Perry looking at the original game or games, I guess, uh, and thinking where to go from here because as i sort of briefly touched on at the beginning so now the zombies have guns um she's really looked into what the potential of potential uh usage of the t virus could be whereas in the games and stuff like that it's generally established now that the t virus is really intended for stuff like tyrants and the zombies are just sort of like an accidental byproduct of that they're not really that important whereas she sort of looks at as how can we grow that idea and you've got these like drone-like zombies who are less visibly um, uh, decaying, I guess. (laughs) Um, They can follow orders. 
Um, they can use weaponry, and then especially by the end of the book, they can speak as well. It's, it's a really interesting, very strange in retrospect idea. Uh, Aaron, how do you feel about these? This because of course it's, it stands really alone from everything else that was going on at the time in Resident Evil, and it would for quite a while. Personally, I always admire the Tri Squads and how she explains how they are made. Mm. Because it's a virus that basically forces you into submission and become a mind controlled puppet that follows the orders of the person in charge before you. And I always thought, well, that's interesting how she even did this, figuring how to set this up. And the fact that he armed them with guns to make them go on patrols was interesting. However, bodily functions are not included. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fair point. <laughs> Uh, Steve, what's your reaction to, uh, as Aaron said, the Tri Squads? Uh, I uh, this is going to sound obviously. I don't. I can't remember my reaction at the time, but now I I see the bad guys from Outpost. I, oh, I yeah. see. I see like you know the Nazi zombies with AK forty sevens and MP forties and all the rest of it, uh, which is probably not the imagery that uh, SD Perry was going for. Uh, the others, I just see like. Pale, confused guys in lab coats. You know the the more the puppeted yeah. folks. Uh, but the the, the tri squad zombies. I see the outpost zombies, um, mm. which is probably not like I said, not the, not the imagery she was going for. But I could take it if it's just the dudes in the green jackets with like an assault rifle. That's still fine. In my head, they just look like Wavo, but obviously in, in 1998. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. I, I can't think what I must have must have visualized them as mentally back then. It's. Um, yeah, a bit of a challenge. I see. <laughs> I can honestly picture sort of being online around that time, not having read the book. As I say, this is the first time I've actually read, sat down and read it, although I've been kind of aware of uh, some of the things that it does like this and being sort of like, oh, why is Caliban Cove considered non-canon? And then reading, oh, it, you know, it had zombies with guns and being like, okay, that's why. But yeah, as I say, it's funny because obviously that's the way the series would go. So I think it's really interesting that S.D. Perry looked at the zombie and went, okay, that's the natural progression for that idea. Uh, James, I, what, oh, sorry, gone. I say it literally does feel like uh, pre Las Plagas uh, in a way mm, with the whole really weapon wielding and the the fact they can speak and plan and strategize. It literally mm. is a case of did, did Capcom lift some notes from Caliban Cook? No. <laughs> uh. Imagine get some royalties on that one, James. What do you think <laughs> of the Tri Squads? Um, you know uh, they're probably other than Rebecca Chambers. They're probably the, the most interesting thing I found about this book. Mm. Um. Because at the time, because I'm thinking in that time period, at the time they were like the most, if they were canon, they were the most deadly BOW. Right. Because they, and they could be used like for spy or sabotage kind of missions. And yeah, it, and it was super spooky. Like SD Perry's so good at writing horror. Yeah. Right. And stuff. And yeah, just when they first meet, uh, God, who is it? Is it Tennyson or someone? Um, like he is so spooky. I didn't even realize actually, because I wasn't like that's how. I mean, other people might have, but I didn't realize. I, I forgot. And they said the names right at the beginning, but I forgot hmm. who this person was. Right when they first met the, one of the first tri tri squads, and then suddenly it goes bad, and I'm like, oh, he was one of the. Oh right, and it's like that's why they're deadly, right? It's because like they're just sitting there, and they can just talk to you like, oh yeah, I need some help, or you know, uh, where's hmm. the toilet, mate? You know, uh, you got twenty p. <laughs> You know, so <laughs> you know, it's like that is really scary. Um, and I like that. Like they can talk, they can hold weapons, um, and yeah, that's scary. But there was a point where, like, it went too far, as it usually does with with Umbrella, with you know, with Griffith and his and his experiment, and they do start deteriorating, right? Eventually, I think. Or am I, I wrong? In I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, because I remember at the end of the book, like. If you, that you know, they're like uh, anyone who's played D and D. They're like minor illusion. You know, you touch them and suddenly, oh, they fall apart. You know, and it's that's what I felt like at the end. Like they, they weren't weak. They were still able, mm. but um, yeah, they kind of fall apart. But yeah, I, I like the I like the tri squads. I still don't know why they're called tri squad. Um, yeah, I didn't quite understand that either. But <laughs> if I remember correctly, it's because they can only function in a group of three. Oh, see, that's also interesting. 
Okay, oh. cool, cool, cool. Because that's like a clear weakness, right? You could do that, put that in a game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah. if uh, I remember correctly, when they kill one of the tri squads, where they actually kill one of them, they kind of get confused at first and then return to their duties, but they're not as strong as they were before. Oh, right. yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and also the, the sort of function that the other sort of squads will lay dormant until, squ say, squad alpha is taken out, then suddenly another squad chooses to engage, which is you know good or bad i thought at least it was a quite an interesting concept yeah and what is del lago what is that del lago thing at the beginning <laughs> the leviathan thing i have no idea giant yeah, bottle feeder, apparently my like, question was it oh go on go on like, i like what was it was it a sal was it a salamander was it like a a failed gamma like i don't know like, it that sounded to, the way i read it, it was that it was huge almost sort of whale like but i i guess only the thing about the T-viruses, especially with ancient organisms, it makes them blow up to ridiculous sizes. So it really could have been anything. She does leave it to your imagination a bit. Yeah. Yeah, like all I she said was it attacked the raft and it's huge and it's a B.O.W. And that Griffin left it out in the water. And then part of you is like thinking, well, what if it goes out and affects stuff? But she explains in the book that he observes that they don't leave. Yeah, they come back. Yeah. Uh, and it had, I, I remember one line. She said it had bulging eyes as well. Mm. You know, which um, I don't know. That that really stuck with me. Like that's, but the whole that, that whole bit was. It's kind of uh, you know the Tomb Raider remakes. Just were you saying that? Right. Oracle, it kind of reminds me of that kind of the first one, the first Tomb Raider, where nothing can leave. You know, Kimiko Island. Mm. Um, yeah. Hmm. And the uh, the other sort of BOW that she invents, I guess, is the MA sevens. One of my notes is literally. What are they? <laughs> you know, they sound like chimeras, not in the Resident Evil sense, in the, in the real sense. They're sort of she describes them as being sort of scaled and like having a snake-like head, but also barrel-chested lion bodies and stuff. I was, I couldn't really get a, a sort of a, a read on what they were supposed to look like, which I, I guess maybe intentional, but I don't know. I um, always pictured the. Uh, this is going to sound strange, and I still do now. It's I pictured the Manticore from Symphony of the Night. <laughs> uh, which obviously it isn't, but that's the first thing that comes to mind when describing these weird, misshapen chimera beasts. Uh, but give them a little bit of a snake head. Yeah. <laughs> the the wiki, the Resident Evil wiki, says that they're a hunter, but there is like citation needed and mm. apparently developed by Birkin and Griffith. Um, but yeah, there was, was, and it was mentioned quite a few times, wasn't it? AMA 7. Yeah, well, I guess the code name would be why you, maybe you'd think about that because obviously it's a mammal of some kind in that case with MA. But yeah, I, again, I suppose that's the beauty of the, writing a book like this is you can kind of leave it up to the the reader's interpretation. It, it's never going to be made no MA twos, <laughs> no, 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 no mesh monkeys. <laughs> um. <laughs> Indeed. Rebecca clutched her Beretta in one shaking hand, watching for a signal from David. He pointed roughly northwest into the compound, shouting to be heard over the whining, spitting clatter of the automatic fire. Rebecca, other door! John, Karen, next building, secure! Steve, we cover, go! As one, Steve and David leaped out and started to fire, the booming rounds punctuating the lighter hail of deadly ammo. John and Karen charged out at a full run, were instantly swallowed up by the shadows. Rebecca spun and trained her weapon on the back door, her heart pounding in her throat. The walls trembled and shook. Die! Jesus, why won't they die? Steve screamed behind her, a strain of disbelief and terror in his voice that made her blood run cold. Zombies? Without looking away from the rectangle of dark wood, Rebecca shouted as loud as she could, her voice cracking over the relentless spray of the automatics. Headshots! Aim for the head! There was no way to know if they'd hurt her. The rifle or rifles kept pounding, approaching. Her thoughts raced to understand. 
Images of the T-Virus victims flitting through her mind. They'd been mindless, slow, inhuman and accidental. Not on purpose, not with purpose. Rebecca, let's go! There was still the sound of an automatic rifle firing, but the boathouse no longer shook from the impact of its force. She shot a glance back, saw Steve still shooting at something, saw David motioning at her to move. She sidled for the open door, catching a sickening, up-close look at the bullet-riddled corpse still hanging there. The head had caved in like a rotting pumpkin. Teeth shattered, gummy flecks of tissue radiating out from behind the skull. The waving hand was no longer connected to the rotting arm. The radius and ulna blown away. It dangled there, like some obscene decoration. Beckoning. Uh, so now we're getting we're getting to the good stuff now. As I say, the, the actual cove. This is what the bit that I uh, definitely enjoyed the most. Once once this started rolling, that's where I, I struggled to put it down a little bit at times. Um, the bit for me in terms of just talking about the wider story now to to wrap up this part. Uh, my favourite part of the whole story was the sort of infection storyline of of a character that uh, winds up rubbing their eye <laughs> uh, and yeah. getting something in it and getting and and as slowly over the course of several chapters becoming more and more infected i thought it was brilliantly well done because at that point that i can think of we hadn't really seen that in resident evil we'd seen marvin sort of get back up but we hadn't seen the sort of slow process i think perry did an amazing job of sort of looking at the keeper's diary and turning that into a a more uh personal thing seeing it happen as you go you see the character sort of deteriorating mentally in the same way which i thought was brilliant um, and, and the fact that nobody knows exactly what to expect except Rebecca and Rebecca standing around sort of being like oh, we need to deal you know worried that this is all going to come back to her in the same way that she experienced the first time I thought yeah I just thought it was brilliantly well handled the infection storyline it it was and also <laughs> again made me question David because he says, like, literally a chapter before we start noticing that she has a headache and starts to rub her eye, he's like, oh, no, did they get infected? You know, we need to find this out. And then he goes there, and like she starts itching her eye. Oh, I've got a little bit of headache. And Steve also, uh, Steve Lopez, I think, um, he also, like, kind of has, a, he's a little bit sluggish, and he doesn't really think it. He's like, oh, but it's just a headache. You know, we'll get to Rebecca and she'll sort you out. And I was like, this guy's bad. He's so bad. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, but no, they didn't happen. And I was like, oh, okay. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering if Perry did, um, I wonder if she did call on that. She thought, yeah, I've made this character. I'm going to make probably pe- stupid people like me, like <laughs> you think every British person is a villain, right? Um, yeah, try and think, you know, oh, he's the bad guy because he's just trying to get these them all together and then they're all infected and yeah, whatever. But yeah. Um <laughs> I love that. But yeah, <laughs> that because it went over like two or three chapters, that infection, and man, Karen went through it. Mm. I felt so bad for her. She went through a lot. Um, and kind of the writing for her was so good too. Like and Oracle, what was your opinion on the sort of infection storyline in the latter half of the book? I really enjoyed how we get to see how Karen gets infected and then starts to deteriorate as the time progresses and Rebecca notices it. But the only thing that really irked me about Karen is that it's stated in the book she is antiseptically clean, and yet she'll go up to a table covered in blood and touch it. (laughs) That's a good point, actually. That always irked me as to why she would do that when she is very i'm not going to touch anything but touches that and then like oh i i itches whoops <laughs> yeah that's a i mean you can't really defend that one i'm gonna say i think you know in interviews sd perry said that it's a bit of a blur this time she's really just sort of like running on caffeine to get these three books done and I just maybe just a silly oversight. I feel like she probably wrote from start to finish and and didn't do too many other drafts. I don't know. I, you know, that's just purely my speculation. There's the occasional mistake and stuff like uh, she said. It's she, funny. It speeded it's... up instead of sped up and stuff like that. I think it's just a just just the case of writing really quickly. 
And I say it's it's funny you mention how Karen gets infected and these uh, these oversights of the character. But there's actually one thing we're probably going to talk about this in the end game of the book. But there's one thing that kind of irks me about the whole thing in that uh, spoilers. Karen gets shot when she's zombified through the head and then thrown into a airlock, which our two surviving heroes at the time are locked in with, uh, which is filling up with water. Now, now Karen gets really infected by. Scraping some blood and accidentally scratching your eye. What is being neck deep in likely T virus blood laced water not going to infect you somehow? No, no you see, because canonically. <laughs> Repetus <that>, immune. <laughs> that, 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 Obviously, that, yeah. It, that's just. It, yeah, but, but I, I thought I, I needed to say this because it's, it's been bugging me since my second reread. <laughs> you're, uh, you're valid. Um, yeah, that's fair. Uh, they make a big point of the, the whole struggle that Karen has to go through in her eventual transformation into a zombie. And and then they just glaze over the fact they're just literally uh, up to their necks. Her, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in, in, in Good a body, body bloody next to them. Hi, guys. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Rebecca Chambers and Dave, you don't know it, but Rebecca and Dave are in full hazmat suits the entire time. <laughs> um, that uh, must be it. That must be it. <laughs> You know, I, I my last point on the on the sort of uh, the story, I guess, is um, one thing they did really well, and this is sort of the almost kind of like the benefit of writing her own original stories that she could sort of come at it from her own perspective um, and, and stuff like that. Is the Chekhov's gun moment, which is a, a filmmaker's term for anyone out there. I mean, I, it's it's quite a common term, so some people will probably be aware of it. But for those people who aren't, um, it essentially means if you put a gun on the wall and you show it at some point that gun is going to go off in fact if you've seen Shaun of the Dead that is a literal version of that uh, phrase you know they keep referencing the rifle in the pub of course they are going to get the rifle in the pub in their hands by the end of the film and they do that wonderfully in this story with Karen's one little trinket of a, of a unexploded grenade that she secretly carries around everywhere and you know yeah. it, it starts with Rebecca just wanting to have a human moment with these strangers that she's put in a team with and she gets to have this moment with Karen who shares this sort of secret with her because she sort of walks in and sees it at the, at the, in the, like a back of a truck or whatever it was um, and I've, and it's so early on and, the, and admittedly maybe because it's a bit of a slog before we get to this moment but then at the end the remembering that she's got that grenade on her dead body which is why of course she gets thrown in the airlock with them even though yeah technically they get infected uh to pull off that grenade and, that, and that's what saves him. I thought that was uh, just a, a stroke of brilliance, really. That I thought it was great. Yeah, definitely. It was a case of uh, when, when the water's rushing and they, they start mentioning the word look and Rebecca goes, ha ha, while David's having like, a mental breakdown. Yeah, she gets a eureka it, moment. Like, yeah, shut the hell up, stars, man. Watch as I rifle through your colleagues' pockets. <laughs> I know what I'm looking for. She carries a grenade from her grandfather. How yeah. the heck does he even get that? Why is she even allowed to carry a live grenade? Whatever <laughs> that accidentally pulls. Uh oh. I mean, whatever. I, it worked out in the end. <laughs> it, was, it was definitely. I, I do. Uh, I agree entirely. It was a great payoff. Mm -hmm. And ironically, it leads to a callback to the live-action films, where the main villain gets jobbed off by a door. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's more satisfying, I find. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, How'd you die? Oh, adore. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought I thought that was um I'm gonna have a different opinion. I didn't nope. like that because I seen it coming. Oh um, really? That's yeah. I, I and I hate it because <laughs> I was like as soon as she showed that grenade, I was like and well, I mean going through like Resident Evil 3 as well, where a grenade is like a nuke. Um I as soon as that was revealed and i like the story like it was a grandpa's and it's like this nobody ever sees them anymore and you know um <laughs> just the pineapple grenade thing it kept on being said and i was like yeah that's going to be used for the last moment something's going to be used for something and then kind of the end is kind of like when they just teleport to caliban um the ending is very sudden mm. and um like that's very that's not like resident evil that's very yeah. un unlike Resident Evil, because typically there are several phases, you know, towards <laughs> the end, but that was it. Um, and I was like, oh, well, I would have liked a little bit more. But at the same time, maybe, you know, that's a kind of a call to SD Perry's writing as well, because I wanted more. 
Mm. Um, but it, yeah, um, but also it's not like a huge loss to the to the story because I like the way I like the journey there. Mm-hmm. The only thing I had a problem with the freaking grenade is that they're fracked in an airlock with water and using an explosive in a tight space like that. Uh, that would have killed them. Yeah, it would have done. Yeah. But that's fine. We look over the logic. <laughs> if it's no, a don't Hollywood worry, they can pineapple survive grenade. Anything. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, they they thought I, I actually expected that grenade to come out sooner. To be fair, uh, you know mm. the the giant leviathan beast they they have to contend with on the water would have been perfect prime to be you know rumble fished with a grenade. Um, Karen, Karen, yell grenade! What yeah. the heck? <laughs> and everyone else turns around and goes, where did you keep that? Oh, it's by Lucky Charm. Uh, also, Karen just has a really unfortunate name. Oh. Yeah, she does. She does, doesn't she? Uh, in 2021, it's, yeah, it's very odd. Do you know what also I thought was great? Uh, we, we talked about how Perry sort of kind of called things in the universe. You know, Rebecca has a sort of moment of love interest almost with uh, the character Steve, which I thought was interesting because that's yeah. obviously to come uh, two years later with Claire in another Resident Evil game. So she's accidentally calling all these little things. <laughs> was it Steve or was it John? Uh, it's Steve Lopez. Steve. Yeah, yeah. J- John's like the uh, the the discount Barry. Well, actually, no, that's mean to John. He's kind no, of wasn't it the other way like... around? No, John's no, no, no. the the masculine. He, he was uh, sort of like. Oh, I thought I it was. Like, the guy, you know. Okay. Yeah, he's the Arnold Schwarzenegger's character in Predator. I always kind of visualize oh. him. Out. I got them mixed up then. <laughs> he looks like girls. Yeah, in Rebecca my talks about how she really likes Steve and how cute he is, and she can't stop thinking about him and yeah, all that they hold stuff. Hands. And then, <laughs> yeah, and then all of a sudden, sorry, kid, but you can't have a romantic interest. Yeah. What? No, the second. The, yeah, that's right. The, the second they introduced him as a, a potential romantic interest, Rebecca, I thought. That, that boy's gonna die. Like, yeah. <laughs> like death sentence. No um, romance in Resident Evil. Yeah, that's Chekhov's love interest right there. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, you'll see a love interest on the wall. Uh, and- <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we haven't spoken about. We haven't spoken about Mister Death on the wall. You know that creepy yeah. moment yeah. with him just with his hand up. You know, like waving. It was so creepy. That is the uh, best example of Perry's continued fantastic writing about gore, isn't it? That's the standout one for this book for me. The, the weird corpse is nailed up to a door. Yeah, it's so cool. The thing is, with Steve's death, I wasn't, I did not expect that to happen. Mm. How she portrayed him dying, I was like, oh, did she really do that to Steve? I was yeah. expecting something else. I quite like that too. That was, it was pretty cool. Pretty cool. That that surprised me. Yeah, that was out of nowhere in a good way, I thought. Because a lot of these sort of yeah. like military group horror film sort of alien style things, people get picked off, you know, throughout the story one by one, but nobody really died until the end and then it all started suddenly happening. I thought that was cool and kind of different. And especially as you say, Steve's one is uh yes, yeah, it's, it's shocking, you know, in a way. Kind of not to tangent a bit, but it reminded me a bit, you know, of um, in Metal Gear Solid. Okay. Yeah, I know, guys. Okay. Um, <laughs> but there's a point where uh, Psycho Mantis literally turns around and says, Meryl, stand right where they can see you and blow your brains out. That's what comes to mind mm. because it's literally Griffiths having a, a moment of like, my plans are all upended a little bit. And and <laughs> basically, yeah, that, that happens and it's horrible. Yeah, absolutely. Who would have thought a mild inconvenience would occur to me? Kill yourself. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's grim. It's definitely the most evil moment of that character, I would say. Uh, who I think, I would imagine we're all probably going to have the same opinion on this dude. He's just a pantomime villain. He's ridiculous. Um, he's, I mean, he's basically just Birkin, but turned up. He literally, oh, my life's work. Oh, look, Umbrella have come to stop me. Oh, Look what I'll do instead. <laughs> just, I thought he was ridiculous. Steve, I know. Do you, you want to say the line? Do you want to say the yeah, line, Sam? Go, just, go ahead. Uh, yeah, he was two steps away from saying, the world will burn in an inferno of hate. Um, <laughs> like his, his motivations and plans are, basically, I'm going to make the entire human race die because yeah. nature or something we're going to decide it in the was, last 10 minutes. Yeah, it's the thing, isn't it, where it's like, oh, humans have become too selfish and disgusting. Let's kill out, kill off all the dumb ones. Uh, yeah, you know, it's kind of overplayed. We need to evolve. Yeah. I Standard. do like his backstory, though. Yeah, I, I like how it's fleshed out a lot, that he's mm. like 
basically a a aspiring mangler before he even gets into Umbrella's work. Yes, yeah, I think that's good as well. You know, um, it kind of asks you questions about who exactly Umbrella are prepared to hire to do the kind of work they do. And the fact that they reject his research studies and stuff for a while there, it's like, okay, mm. so that's probably why he got a little bit upset. He's very uh, damaged, let's put it that way. Um, Man, it's always the crazies, you know? Yeah. Why is that? <laughs> if they ever focus too much on the word control, generally it's a red flag so far in the Harry Earth novel. <laughs> I will control you. Okay, that's a big no-no. Yeah. If you if you wear a white trench coat, oh, you're a bad one. I s- I, I did love the, the, the point where it very much, it, it, the novel almost backtracks and explains how he did, like how he subjugated the rest of his colleagues. Mm. And yeah. it's so vile. Like, uh, where he basically drugs them all like, all right, but this one never has breakfast at this time, so you, go kill them. And uh, mm. so deliciously evil. I mean, it's not like an This one's not an accident. This isn't like, you know, a botched sample retrieval or... You know, someone accidentally it was dropping all a lot. Planned out, mm, yeah, meticulously. Indeed, yeah. I mean, yeah. At least he's got those moments. I'll give him that much. I mean, as a, as a actual confrontation with a character, yeah, it's it's a bit overly silly to me. But his backstory I mean, only, is decent. Yeah. The only thing that he didn't expect, to, you know, he would have gotten away with it had it not been for the zombie with a spare hand grenade. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, the thing is that I like f- I'm fascinated about it, is that he found Steve to be the, the most best subject for his research, and yet in the fit of rage, he clearly lost all train of thought and killed the only specimen he favored the most. And then probably if he wasn't killed, he would probably realize he done effed up. Mm. Do you know, I actually kind of like that in a way because there's a moment earlier where it almost sort of implies that when he gets too angry, he kind of blacks out and he he does something yeah. and then he realizes later where he is, he's sort of moved somewhere else and done something. So yeah, that's very much his sort of like fit of rage, isn't it? Where he'll, he'll do something and then worry about the consequences later. In terms, of other, in terms of other characters, um, James, I'll throw it to you. I think first to talk about Rebecca, um, you said in the first book club episode that you thought that SD Perry really did get Rebecca's character right. Uh, do you feel the same way about this time around? Oh yeah, definitely. Like she's like, I just love her interactions with all of the group right at the beginning. I said it at the start of this podcast, but I love the respect that stars has for her as well. Like, when you play RE1, um, she's kind of treated a little bit like a joke character, right, where she's not really taken seriously. Um, but I did when I, when I, you know, some people would. Like, it's the way she's kind of portrayed in some respects. And then in this book, it just reinforces, nah, man, everybody respects this girl because she's 18, 19, coming on 19. She's, like, she's like a genius, and she can also kick butt. But, and everybody respects her for that, and she's gone through some of the toughest times. You know, she's a well, she's a veteran stars member now, and yeah, she really pushes that. That kind of, you know, she's she takes charge. Um, she, you know, when, when like another kind of male character, which this happens a lot. You know, this is probably just with S. D. Perry's uh, writing. You know, when a male character tries to take charge, Rebecca Chambers is like. Now nah, I took on an entire house of ghoulies. I can do it. Give me a gun, you know. Um, you know, and then like the stars members, they all know that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, as well, they they all call to it. Um, you know, Jill saying, um, you know, that she she really cares for her, but she knows she's capable, even mm-hmm. though she's you know she's gone through it. They still worry about her because she is a teen, you know. But they 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 still know that she can she can handle herself. Um, yeah, I thought, <laughs> I thought there's some bits that were a bit weird, like, and, you know, people are probably going to read those no, because you're a Rebecca, Rebecca fanboy, but there are a bit, the stuff that was just shoehorn, shoehorned in because huh, romance, you know, like the thing with, uh, the guy that I can't remember the name of. Steve, um, yeah. yeah. And then there was like a little bit with David as well. And it was like, you don't need to do that. Just. You don't need to do that. This mm. story isn't about that. Just you know, Resident Evil isn't about that, really. Mm. You know, the the first trilogy is not about love interest. Like it's about surviving. 
And yeah, it was just a, it was just touched on a little bit. I'm glad they didn't go too deep deep into it um, because it just wasn't the time or the place. And Rebecca literally says that she thinks that she's like, "No, nah, this isn't the time to be thinking like that." Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah, yeah. Um, we need to move forward. And again, just making me love that character even more because she's so focused. And she even calls. I'm gonna. This is like the wizard thing. It's like the wizard thing in D anD D or whatever fantasy thing you're thinking. Wizards always turn bad guys because they can get so powerful. And Rebecca Chambers talks has this kind of moment to herself where she she basically, in summary, says geniuses, if they don't check themselves, can become your Birkin or mm. your Griffith or your Marcus or whoever else. You know, they can become these if they don't check themselves. And she says she is going to always be looking out for that. And that little like that little speech she does, I wanted to find the quote, actually, before we did the podcast. But that little quote she does is so important, not just, like, in a story sense, not just in the game sense, but also in a real world, checking mm-hmm. yourself always, like, in case you're looking for that extra power, edging forward, right? Keep yourself back. Focus on what's at hand and do not step on toes or be evil. <laughs> Don't be bad, yeah. you know, because it, you can easily get lost in the moment and tunnel. I think that's what she says. You can tunnel vision and get lost in that one specific thing and forget everything around you, um, which is what happened to Griffith, what happened to Birkin and all the other <laughs> evil mad scientists. They, mm. they, they had the wizard effect. Um, so, yeah, in summary, I love Rebecca Chambers. <laughs> I, you know, I think that's that is a, a very astute point. Um, even that sort of a character part of her that's still true today, even you know, though th- this wasn't written by Capcom or anything, but uh, her choice specifically to do something that can be you know, that's only good. She works on the outside, sort of, you know, in yeah in an advisory role stuff like that she's shown she's capable on the front line you know with zero and one but in stuff like vendetta she's not a part of a military faction she's doing good the way that she can uh, mm. rather than putting herself in a position where it's you know yeah it, it's it's just a whole she, they got that part of her character totally right where yeah she's contributing in her own separate way one of my favorite yeah, she, bits that she did she even oh sorry, sorry go ahead. Go oh she even talks about kind of getting she even like says a bit where she's like you know she's fa- infatuated by what these people have done and what mm. they've achieved and then she says she like kind of she brings herself back and she's like but they've done so much evil they've mm. done so much bad you know they've done so much bad things i really have to think about that you mm. know and i need to tell other people about that too oh she's such a good character i love her so much there was one simple bit that I loved. Gets back round to that uh, Karen infection story. Um, it does so says so much about her on a personal basis. Is that she says to Karen that they will find the lab and, and find the vaccine before she hurts anyone, and then it specifically says afterwards that she hopes she didn't lie to her. I thought that's just a, not just yeah. great. You know, it's a great line, but specifically for Rebecca, but it's a great line in general. Yeah, because um, she says she's next to it. She's next to her, and she she, I mean, she does lie to her because she doesn't know. Because no, she exactly. says, because she uses that kind of you know that doctor's bedside manner, mm-hmm. where she says w- you're going to be fine, you're going to be okay, mm-hmm. you know. And it's like, oh, we know she's not, but yeah. it's okay, Rebecca, you're all right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we know. <laughs> yeah. Um, in terms of characters, Oracle, any particular standouts for you from the book? Either someone that you really enjoyed reading or someone that maybe you didn't? I actually enjoyed all of them, but like I said about Karen, that was the only thing that irritated me because, mm-hmm. like I said, she's supposed to be septically clean and she decides to touch something dirty <laughs> in a room that's known to be covered in a virus. That's the only thing that just irritated me. But then again, it's a story plot. Like, oh, somebody died here. I'm going to run my finger across this dry blood and ponder about their last moments. Oh, my eye itches. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's a Karen thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Steve, any standout characters for you? Generally, they're all okay. Uh, I feel like uh, the boyfriend character, Steve Lopez, was kind of a little bit weak. 
Yeah. Uh, I'm a big yeah. fan of Rebecca in this book, but that's because she stands a little bit more parallel to all of her previous versions and what well, versions that come since, in that she somehow has that medley of confidence when it's needed, but also uh, very conflicted and confused. Mm. Like when she's challenged, uh, especially in the early game, in the early game, in the early parts of the book, when like, you know, David's trying to test her. Uh, and to see how capable he is, she immediately nails the question, and he go and basically mentally is going, "All oh, right, turns out she actually is a badass." Um, and then the conflict she has that literally she will tell Karen to her face that they're going to find a vaccine, it's going to be fine. And then the second they are separated, she's basically thinking she's dead. How do I how do I break it to him and try and try yeah. to reconcile that conflict? Because she she knows deep down that she's worried about Steve, she's worried about Karen. Uh, how does she tell them? And she can't bring herself to actually like admit it, uh, which I find very interesting. You know, the fact that she's basically, like you said, a good bedside manner, but then also pretty much terrified and doesn't know how to verbalize it. Mm. Um, yeah. Overall, I liked pretty much all of the the surrogate stars. The, the, the they, they feel like weird parallel versions in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, David Trapp comes across to me as somewhere between Pierce Brosnan and Wesker, but not evil. Like, he's very focus-minded, trying to have a plan and a strategy, and when it goes completely Pete Tong, he's, uh, then he's lost. Mm, yeah. Do you know, I like that as well. Like, his character has a bit of an arc to it, in a way, as well, because so, him being the head of the operation, and then along the way, he always turns to his team and says, you know, is this it now? Do we pull out now? And they're always like, no, got to keep going. And, you know, the the guilt that piles on top of that as he goes uh, is really interesting to me. Yeah, he's, he strikes me as like a parallel universe Wesker that's not on the bad guy side, uh, mm-hmm. which, is, which is weird. I know that's a strange thing to say. Um, John, I, I, at first I didn't like, but the more I go into the, the novel, the more his, uh, yeah, I don't know what you'd call it, his facade, his, like, you know... His attitude mm-hmm. as some kind of lover boy badass shatters the second anyone's in peril. He loses it, and mm-hmm. the get the, the game. I keep saying the game. It's not a game. It's a book, Steve. You put it. You put it in between your hands and you read. Uh, uh, when it fakes out that he's died, and then the first thing he says when he comes out of the is, "You all look like crap." And then <laughs> yeah, I, I fell in love with him. It was amazing. So yeah, yeah and I was, we've gone over Karen already, and despite one massive misstep regarding the handling of deadly viruses, she was fine too. Like the the only weak characters for me are Steve because it's basically uh, yeah, I'm I'm a normal guy who's also gonna be very friendly with Rebecca and then uh, I'll have a dirt moment and get injected with the horrible virus. And that's it. Griffith's umbrella scientist maniac one oh one, which is fine for the second novel in the series, especially at this point when that ground hadn't been tread so thoroughly. Yeah, yeah, this is true. Actually, we had, obviously this. Yeah, it's the second book. We, there is no mad scientist in the first one, so you know, we got that one. So it'd be interesting to see how she handles sort of writing Birkin when we get to that. Um, speaking of writing, uh, just general quick touch on her writing style. We talked about the strength of her gore already, and I'm sure we'll bring that up with everyone because it's definitely a high point um, with her horror and gore and stuff like that. I, I with the first book. Um, she did the same thing in this one, where there's sort of like prologue, prologue of newspaper clippings and stuff. I really like that touch. You know, it makes you very aware that this is being handled by someone who thoroughly enjoyed the first game and understands it. And, uh, you know, despite my issues with the pacing, um, in terms of the overall story, I think as the writing goes, it's paced quite well. Instead of just being a list of, you know, and then the character walked down this hallway, then they opened this door, and then they picked this up, and then they examined this. She, she actually gives the right amount of time in the right places for characters to think about what's going on, and then brings you back round, sort of the, the loop of stuff actually happening, and then in sort of internal monologue. Um, I never felt like it was weighted too you know, one way or the other too much, personally. Um, Oracle, what's your what's your feelings on S.D. Perry's general writing style, I guess? I really enjoy it. She's got a unique style and the way she details things. And as a writer myself, I really like her writing style because mm-hmm. it helps you figure out, okay, this is how the story's going to end up playing out with this style and how she details the room environment, how the puzzles work, how the right. characters are behaving, the 
things around them, the tiniest little details like, oh, the specks of dust on the coffee cup or something like that. It's really sets you into the place where you see it visually pristinely. And then it's like, all oh, right, I'm there. I can figure this out before I, before the characters do kind of mm. thing, you know? Mm. Yeah, I think it would be very easy to just pick any old writer and say, hey, we need, we, we're paying you to make books, to make bank on this. But she, yeah, she's, she's, she's a commendable writer. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan as well. Uh, James, what do you think of Perry's writing style? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're going to be talking about her writing style a lot through this series, but still top top notch really um in terms of horror and i did feel that this one was spookier and more horror like kind of creepier than the first one was Mm, i think like there's less with the first book there's so much to convert maybe that's what it is there's so many different enemies that she had to get in there and stuff like that this one is definitely its own monster yeah like she like i felt like her as a writer she was creeping with Mm. the writing because she needed to set up that moment with the tri squad or with the the weird water creature or you know wh- whatever else like she or with Mister Death she always spent her time kind of creeping up on these moments and that was really cool and I appreciated that because I love horror writing just in general um, yeah and after kind of doing this as well I'm going to kind of because. <laughs> The only books I've not read uh, of the Alien the Enemy universe really are the S.D. Perry ones. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so I might actually pick them up as well, um, just knowing how kind of unabashed she is mm. about describing things as well. Like, she goes full in and does well with that. Yeah, mm. uh, really enjoy it. Yeah, Thank really you. enjoy her writing. And that, as same with you, like, kind of other than the pacing, like, the sun changes, uh, which like like you said as well is probably due to the deadlines like and probably things like that yeah yeah um when, when the actual story got going yeah really i really bit into it and it kept me kept me interested and steve what was your thoughts on uh sd perry's writings for caliban cove it's like James said, really, if they, the first the first film, God, I'm getting my media mixed up. <laughs> the first mixed media book, is Caliban Code. Uh-oh. Yeah, the, the first book, Umbrella Conspiracy, felt much more like a crime novel with zombies, mm. whereas this felt like a horror a horror novel with conspiracy. Mm. Uh, so it's it's a nice juxtaposition between the two. Otherwise, it fundamentally felt more of the same, but I'm not saying that in a negative way. I, you know, I obviously enjoyed it enough to go back and read it like another two times in preparation for the podcast. So, yeah, it, it's a fun read. It's it's a little mm. bit light on, uh, shall we say, time in terms of like you know we just seem to skip to where we need to be at, at some points. Like uh, I'm pretty sure at the end of the Raccoon City dock, they there is just like a portal that teleports them directly to Calum, <laughs> you know, Calum and Co. Uh, and it's then like that fast travel point. <laughs> yeah, and, and then from they go from like you know lab to caves to secret like underground shipwreck mm. lab pretty quickly. So we'll, we'll we'll spend a lot of time talking in one area and then warp to another and then warp to another and and that's a weird bit I suppose in regards passage of time and movement. But I, otherwise, I, I really can't complain. Uh, we get a lot of detail on like the character motivations, as silly as they are. Uh, we we get a full like breakdown of how he wanted to do it and his plan which is pretty good i think like we, we don't really know even now i'm not sure what alex wesker's plan was other than copy yourself into another body mm. you know for example or yeah, uh, yeah. the the veltro terrorists they're just like yeah lol kill people with fish um <laughs> yeah you know, hey. Careful with your goldfish there. It might kill you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe the big monster was a monster goldfish. Yes, maybe that's what uh, it was. It, it was clearly Del Lago and Malacoda at the same time. <laughs> that's right. You know, <laughs> only five plus, maybe ten years. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, there is no, I have no real complaints other than mm. that. And the, the fact that the heavily infectious virus doesn't work on the person who was infected by its corpse <laughs> which is still like that, that still is is uh, you know pickling in my brain a little yeah but i think yeah. it's you know it's funny uh what you said there about sort of characters warping around it's who'd have thought that people you, that anyone would ever draw a comparison between the sd perry resident evil books and people's complaints about the last couple of seasons of game of thrones but there you go <laughs> um, 
So my final question for everyone before we wrap up is uh, adaptation versus original. So obviously what I'm asking is, now we've read book one, which is based on Resident Evil 1, and book two, which is an original story. Uh, how would you compare them? Is there any particular preference in terms of... Not not necessarily the story, of course, because it's hard to compare an original story with Resident Evil 1, but um, how she handles them differently and stuff like that. Um, personally, for me, as I said at the, sort of the top, I thought the changes that she introduced were very bold, and you have to kind of respect uh, the ideas that she came out with. No slouch are coming up with the right kind of ideas at the time of where you could take stuff like the T-Virus, even if that's not where the series actually went. Um, but out of the two books, and maybe it's the pacing thing, I think I re- I enjoyed... And also, of course, it's because I know what a bit what to expect and I'm interested to see how she handles it. Uh, I, I enjoyed the Umbrella Conspiracy more personally. Uh, James, out of your two, out of the two we've read, what's your preference, adaptation or original so far? Uh, so the first, the first book or the second? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, so I, pref- even though I keep going on about it, you know, there are th- some things that I'm clearly going to bring forward that are better like for me personally, but overall I would say the first book is, is, is a better read for me. It's more fun. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, however, like I, I do love the second book and I, I love the horror aspect of it. It's very much more horror, but I know more about the first book and like, I know the characters more uh, and yeah, in terms of adaptation to the game, like it's, it's more, um, what's the word? It, it it sticks more to the to the Resident Evil franchise than the second book does. Whereas the second book feels like, oh, here's here's like three or four bullet points. You got to put these in because they're Resident Evil. You know, the first book is like it's all Resident Evil, mm-hmm. right? And every everything and it's just built on. She's just put like more detail into it because it's a book. So yeah, the first one for me is is uh, is is a more fun read. That's fair. Um, Oracle, where do you stand on this? preference between book one and book two i like them both <laughs> <laughs> that's i mean that's that's books, a good answer yeah with book one we go back to the mansion with book two we find out what rebecca's been doing because like i said before I, as a kid i've always wondered where rebecca was during the events of resident evil 2 and resident evil 3 and with caliban cove i always thought oh so this is where she went it makes sense now mm-hmm. you know because she certainly wouldn't be staying in the city because of what's been going on and how they figured out about the Umbrella Corporation and how they were treated at the RPD by Chief Irons, the likely chance of her staying would be very slim. And with the events of Caliban Cove in the book, I felt this is perfect because it sends her away from the city before it gets destroyed. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could argue that so, it's yeah. canon. If you, if, you, if, you, if you change, you know, how stars work, you could argue that it's canon, right? I guess if you wanted to have this as Rebecca's sort of story after the mansion... Some some form. Yeah, I, I, you know, yeah, it, technically, we don't know what happened to we, her after. Right, the absolutely. Yeah, the next time we hear anything from her is the stage. I guess is that right? Jeez. Yeah. Damn. So yeah, yeah. I mean, Rebecca, arguably... where have you been all this time? Oh, you know, I've been vacationing in Caliban Cove, and then I went to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I just went quiet for years and years and years. I agree. You know, it's always been one of the books I've been interested to pick up and read for exactly that uh, reason. You know, just to find out what happens to this character next. Um, Steve, what's your preference from uh, Umbrella Conspiracy and Caliban Cove? Trying to find a way to metrically rate them against each other is rough for me. Yeah, it I, is. Yeah, it's, it's tough. As a strong adaption of the first game, I think you know the book, the first book, Umbrella Conspiracy, is obviously going to be the stronger of the two. But like Oracle said, this this brings us a unique story of a character we have literally not seen at the time. We hadn't seen them at all until like literally the stage, which is what ten years ago for us now, but mm. also ten years hence from when this book came out. Right. So the the appreciation there for giving Rebecca something to do and making her a bit more of her own standalone standalone character, and I believe this continues, but we will get there when we get there on the book club episodes. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's, it's something to commend the fact that we actually get a character that is recognisably the character from the first game, going on their own solo adventure. But yeah, as much as I prefer the tonal shift from crime novel to horror, it still doesn't quite make the make the jump because things teleport around and I feel like this could benefit a lot more from having a video game explain all the visual cues because it feels like sometimes the 
the environments feel samey, mm. for one of a better term. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so for those points, unfortunately, yeah, of the two, Umbrella Chronicle, uh, Umbrella Conspiracy is still the stronger. But that's not saying that, you know, Caliban Clove or Caliban Clove, I got to pronounce it, is not a bad book. It, it's, a, it's, a fine, it's a fine follow up. You know, it, it, yeah. it's definitely, yeah. yeah. Greed. Yeah. Indeed. Um, I am, as I'm sure you all are, interested to see where S.D. Berry takes the, the series, not just for the next book, which is the adaption of Resident Evil 2, but after that, we've got Underworld, the second original novel. So I'm, now I've read Caliban Cove, I'm very curious to see uh, where she takes that one. But that is going to do it for this podcast. Nothing else remains for me but to thank our contributors. If you'd like to be part of the show, then please look into auditioning for our file readings. Join the Discord server to get in touch with members of our team and our community and discuss Resident Evil with us and other fans. Listen to the podcast live as it's being recorded, etc. You can find a link to the server as well as our Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, Instagram, YouTube and more over at fhspraypod.com. You can find the podcast on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iTunes. And if you enjoyed the show, please do leave us a review where you can. It helps spread the word. You can also su- you can also support the show by picking up some merch or at patreon.com forward slash FA Spray Pod for as Oh, you know what? I missed that out of the housekeeping. I'll have to edit that back in. You can also support the show by picking up some merch or at patreon.com forward slash FA Spray Pod for as little as $1 a month. In our next episode, we add another instalment to our character driven series as we go undercover to recap every appearance of the elusive lady in red in profile. Ada Wong. Thank you to the panel. You can follow all of the Pueblo people individually. I'm at Sinaiac underscore 123. Steve is at FB. Steve was taken. James is at Moist Elder OFF. And Aaron is at The Oracle Dragon. And finally, thank you for listening and have a good week. y'all what do you think about the puzzles in the book yeah do you know i meant to bring that up as well <clears throat> there's just one isn't there i think well there's not really but there's the one, one that the main f- one that's mentioned is time rainbow <laughs> <laughs> it's uh yeah the one that stood out to me i suppose the one when I, mean, I say there's just one the one that stood out was the chess puzzle thing that made me think oh this is very like the game which i think is the first one really but i'm glad that she tried to do something is yeah because the- whenever like, she brings in the puzzles it's like oh memories mm. <laughs> Because now the games don't hardly have any puzzles. I was going to say, like, she did in the book. This books, one the goes to don't. here, and that goes to here. Mm. Instead of making you think like they used to. To be fair, I do like two's puzzles is just take item to location over and over again. But yeah, <laughs> yeah you move you move two book say, bookcases to the right. You know, <laughs> oh yeah, it's good not point. That bad. But uh, <laughs> I did appreciate that some of them were so uh, at least. For me, maybe because I've heard the riddle so many times, but the the, the one man from St. Ives. Uh, you know, the, the, you literally <laughs> oh, can... Oh, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, the answer is one. Like, the, the answer is one, David, <laughs> just screaming at the book. Um, <laughs> I, I love the fact that some of them are Resident Evil easy. Uh, mm. Yeah, I think that was good. Just push the right button or the right colour. <laughs> yeah, and they've got yeah. the cheat codes, Scott. So, you know, the, Trent printed out the strategy guide. You know, <laughs> Do you think he wrote it in the, the sleeve <laughs> of the book? <laughs> Oh, I forgot. Oh, man, I forgot to say who the F is Trent. Oh, damn it.